Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Patricia Farah, author of Science, A 4,000-Year History. Tackling such a vast subject must have been daunting, but thankfully the result is far from daunting. The book is a wonderfully refreshing, stimulating read that overturns preconceptions and makes innumerable, often surprising links, for example between alchemy and modern-day chemistry. As Patricia, who teaches history and philosophy of science at Cambridge, explains in her introduction, in a sense, the history of science is the history of everything. Modern science, technology and medicine are interwoven, intimately bound up in a giant knotted web with every other human activity all over the globe. Given that she had to start her history somewhere, I asked her how she decided on the Babylonians. They were enormously influential on the Greeks. The Greeks inherited all their astronomical observations and also significantly they had a big influence on modern life. If you look at a digital clock which seems about as far from a Babylonian tablet as you can get, you'll notice that there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and that is because of the Babylonians. If you do even the most elementary form of geometry, you know that there's 360 degrees in a circle. That comes from the Babylonians. And if you're the sort of person whose science extends as far as the horoscope in the newspaper, then you'll know the 12 signs of the zodiac. And they also come from the Babylonians. Now, I imagine if someone had sat down to write a, a 4,000 year history of science throughout most of the 20th century, they would have adopted a model which I think you say goes back to Plato, which is like some kind of relay race in which a, a flame, a torch is passed from hand to hand. Mm. And it's effectively a succession of, of great men. And that's how the story is told. And you very clearly wanted to, to subvert that and do something very different from that. Plato originated this model called the torch of knowledge model. And it's a bit, it's a bit as though science was a, a, an intellectual Olympic race with all these intellectual athletes racing up the mountain of truth. I think there's several reasons why that model doesn't work very well. The most famous example, perhaps, is Newton, who allegedly sat under the apple tree and had a flash of inspiration. And those sort of moments are quite often called eureka moments after Archimedes, who jumped out of the bath, and James Watt, who watched a kettle boil. And when you look at those moments in more detail, you realise it wasn't quite so straightforward as that. Newton may or may not have had a flash of inspiration under his apple tree, but he certainly spent about another 20 years before he published his theory on gravity. If you look at a topical scientist of 2009, is Charles Darwin. He certainly didn't have a flash of inspiration. He went on the Beagle voyage in 1837. He didn't even collect his data properly. He came back with all the birds from all the different islands in the Galapagos all muddled up in one big collection bag. And it was only when he got back to London that somebody else sorted, sorted them out for him. So I don't think great scientists do have flashes of inspiration. I don't think they do have eureka moments. I think that's one problem. Another problem is that a huge number of other people are involved in science. So if you think about Newton and Darwin, the people who, who I've named, each of them had a a sort of team of people working with them, publishing their books, building instruments, helping them, developing their theories. The form of Newtonianism, which we have now, is not really exact is nothing really much like the form of Newtonianism that Newton himself expounded. There have been a lot of changes and modifications over the centuries. Another reason I don't like that version of history is if you think about how it is that science has become so important, which for me is the most important question. If you go back to the time of Newton, for example, science wasn't particularly important, whereas now it's absolutely the fundamental backbone of society. So if you ask how is it that science has achieved such preeminence in modern society, you have to look at how science has spread. It's no use somebody like Newton or uh, Darwin or Lavoisier having a marvellous idea and then not telling anybody about it. Communication is important in science. Education is important. Translation is important. When you start thinking of all those aspects of science, you have to start thinking about the educators, the illustrators, the classifiers, many of whom were women. You have to start thinking about all the invisible assistants, the lab technicians, the people who actually built the instruments, made the experiments work. So there's far more people involved in science than, than the few sort of great geniuses we choose to measure, mention. We've kind of inherited this notion that religion and science are diametrically opposed. Mm. 
enemies, opponents. And your book really problematizes that. I think this idea that science is at war with religion stems very much from the 19th century, when it became mutually advantageous for scientists and clergymen to claim that they were the authorities. I think most of these debates are For example, the Galileo debate is a very good example, is about who has power in society. Galileo got into trouble because he dared to contradict the Pope. There were genuine debates going on about whether Copernicus was right or Tycho Brahe, or or whether a Platonic version of the universe would, um, would work better. So there were scientific debates. Galileo's transgression was to say that he knew best and to say that the Pope was wrong. I think... There are many examples in the past where science and religion work very closely together. If you look at Copernicus, or the astronomers of his period, if you look at his contemporary astronomers who were working in the Islamic empire, their interest was in working out predictions uh, for the calendar to work out the times of prayer to work out the direction of Mecca if you go back to Babylon which is when I started the reason people were doing astronomies was to was to find predictions for auspicious times for, for coronations if you go back to the 17th or 18th centuries what people were trying to do was reconcile the new scientific ideas with what it said in the Bible people looked at the natural world and said, look, the world is so fantastic. This is evidence that God exists. The whole point of doing science was to work out God's plan for the universe. So there was absolutely no contradiction whatsoever. 